Thank you for where we've been this morning as we have sang the songs that honor you, the songs that stir our hearts, the songs that challenge us. Thank you for where we are right now as we prepare to open the very Word of God and allow your Word to address us and your Word to speak to us. Thank you, Father, for where you are taking us today if we follow you, if we choose to go with you. Thank you, Father, again. For all that are here, may we open our hearts to what is going to be said, what has been said, and may we be a different person in some way when we walk out of this door after services today than we was when we came in. Our real reason for here is to honor you. Honor a God that is able. Honor a God that is, is love and the epitome of what love is all about. When I think of your love, your mercy, your forgiveness, I realize that I'm unworthy to receive a love like that. But you didn't give it to me because, you, because I was worthy. You gave it to me because you loved me. And that is how you deal with each of us. Your will be done as we move forward today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Turning your Bibles, if you will, today to, to begin with to 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter. We're going to be looking uh, at the first 11 verses. The slide that I chose that uh, uh, seemed to suit where I'm trying to go today was a slide entitled, Who Are You a Slave To? And that's pretty self-explanatory. What is the thing in our lives that pulls us away from God that many times we don't really pay that much attention to it until sometimes we begin to pray and and somehow when we pray, God doesn't seem to be hearing us. So what are you a slave to? Not somebody else, not somebody that sits beside of you, in front of you, or behind you. We're talking about you and me today. We're talking about you and me. We're talking about King David. But as I read the passage and began to develop the message, I had to pose the question, which is my title today, King David, one of us, one of us, and I hope by the time we complete our message today, we will realize that King David was one of us. And the scripture, again, we're looking at three passages, quite long. We may not get into all of those today. If we don't, uh, we will just pick those up next Sunday uh, as we move forward. Mom and I pick up Trey and Aiden from school on Mondays and Thursdays. And Monday evening, I had picked up Trey from Stanton River, and we were riding down the road, 24, headed home. And the car in front of us threw something out. It rolled down the road, finally over in the ditch and up on the bank, and it stopped. And as Trey and I observed what it was, it was an apple. I, <laughs> I asked Trey, I said, do you reckon Eve was in that car? <laughs> and with the youth of his innocence and... Uh, answering the question, he said, Granddaddy, said Eve is not in that car. So that kind of, kind of got my attention as I was preparing already this particular message. But I also read some material from R.C. Scroll, and uh, not his message, mind you. This is my message, so you can't get after him after this is over. And he made a comment Whatever happened to sin? You know, in the time of David that we're looking at in the Old Testament, before Jesus came and he was able, he is able or will be able to open the scroll one day. He is able 
to die on a cross for your and my sins. And he is able to work in us as much as we allow him to work in us. We aren't two or three or four or five different groups here today. We aren't here as whatever and here as whatever and here's whatever. We're all the same. We're all one. And when God looks at us, number one, he created us in his image. We talked about that last Sunday. We talk about it quite often. But folks, that means something to me. When I realize that God thought enough of me and you to create us in his image. And when I think of that, I realize that I need to think enough of why God created me in his image to try to live like a person created in God's image. Do I always do that? No. And you don't either, folks. So we choose to stay where we are, or we choose to move to be more of what God created us to be. So sin has lost its sin down through the years. I think more in the 19th century. Why? Because I lived there. And the 20th century, because I'm living there. I think we have come to where we don't recognize sin as sin. We kind of overlook it. Yeah, I'm aware. I'm fully aware of Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Of God. That all simply means all. It means I have sinned and fallen shorter than God's expectations of me. It means you've sinned and fallen short of God's expectations for you. But He didn't throw us out, He continued and continues to love us. Love us just like we are, but loves us too much to let us stay that way. All have sinned. Why do we sin so naturally and so unthinkably? Why do we do that? Well, let me just use again R.C. Scroll's definition of that. Dogs bark, birds fly, bees sting, sinners sin. Why? Why do dogs bark? Why does birds fly? Why does bees sting? Well, more than that, why does sinners sin? We are not sinners because we sin. We are sinners. We sin because we're sinners. That's our nature. That is our nature. Why did God allow such a nature when he created me, you and I, in his image, when he created Adam and Eve and put them in the Garden of Eden, why did he allow such a nature to give us a choice as to why we do what we do? You see, God is not in charge of us doing what we do. He allows us to be in charge of what we do. So let me remind you, when we sin, sin is still the sin that, that, that David committed, that we're going to read about in just a moment. And when we are children of God, when we recognize that we have been created in God's image, Our unfaithfulness to God should convict us. When we do the things that we do and don't really realize that they are against God, 
then there's something wrong, not with God, but with us. So let's read the Scripture. We're going to begin with the 11th chapter and uh, get as much out of that as we can, at least the first few verses, get as much out of that uh, as we can. And we're going to be looking at King David's sin with Bathsheba. We all know that. We've studied that in Bible school. We've studied that in Sunday school. We've studied that in Awana. We've preached from that from the pulpit. So we're all aware of David and Bathsheba. Both were involved in the sin. Just like you and I are involved in our sins. So let's read the script, and we're going to take time as we move through. You're not going to hurry through this and If what we don't get today, we'll get next Sunday. And if we don't finish next Sunday, we'll do it the next Sunday. Or the Sunday after that. The following Sunday would be Keith's day. And it came to pass. And it came to pass. Let me tell you something, folks. This week, maybe today, you are going to be tempted with a choice. may not think it's a big choice. But let me remind you, if it dishonors God, it's a sin. Could be as simple as not being nice to people that we're around. Sure it could be. Could be as simple as as, as using the wrong words when we speak. Sure it could be. And it could be a number of other things. But today we are going to focus on on David's sin, and let me remind you, I am going to try to keep us focused on the fact that David is one of us. Had his choices. Sure, he was a king at the time. Sure, he was in charge of about everything in the kingdom, at least of Israel. Sure, he had men out at battle in battle where he should have been himself. And what I see that that represents, folks, is wherever we are, whether we are out at work, whether we're in school, wherever we are, whether we're in our homes, wherever we are, we need to live a life that honors God. And anything that doesn't honor God is a sin. David was at home. You know, I learned something through this study that, that, that I wish we did today. The commentaries that I chased or studied or followed said that back in these days, in the winter time, they didn't fight. They didn't war. It was springtime and summertime when they fought. I never heard that before. And I suppose some of you haven't heard it before either. But I wish that we would stop fighting. Well, I wish we'd stop fighting, period. And if we can't do any better than that, I wish we would stop fighting in the wintertime. Well, that's for whatever it's worth. But anyway, David had his men out fighting. And he was lounging around home. <clears throat> now, why was he doing that? I don't know. Don't, don't have any idea. And don't need to know. But he was doing what he chose to do. Just like you and I. When this service is over, we will do what we choose to do. That's who we are. That's who we are. We are a people of choice. We are a people of choice. So it came to pass that after the year, that means after the winter had passed according to the commentaries, was expired at the time when King David would go forth to battle, David sent Joab, his captain, with his men out to fight, and he sent His servant went with him, 
and all of Israel that were fighting men, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rehab, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. David didn't go. Let me just slip something in here that really don't go. But I think it fits when we choose not to be in church. We miss something. Don't miss as much when I'm speaking as you do when Keith and Taylor are speaking. I know that. But we miss something. We choose to do that. We choose to do that when we choose not to come to Bible study. We choose to do that. What is Bible study? It's studying the Bible. What is the Bible? It's our road map to heaven. So we make choices like David. Don't jump on David's back. David was like you and I. He made his choices. Now, he didn't make the choice to do what he did that early. The next verse. And it came to pass again in the evening that David went up to the top of his house. Most of the houses back in those days, I'm told, were flat. Got off his bed, walked up on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw something. He saw something. You know, folks, what we, and you English teachers, forgive me, what we saw with our eyes is not a sin. Don't go too far with me until I finish. Is not a sin. It is how we process what we saw. David processed what he saw in the wrong way. How do you, how do you, how do I process what we see? You know what? When we see something, and like David was seeing, we immediately know that it's wrong to continue to process that. So we have the choice to drop it or to continue to saw it, if you will. So David saw, so I'm sure that it was a beautiful sight without catching what he saw and what got his attention and what almost wrecked his life. Almost wrecked. His life. In verse 3, David knew who he was seeing. He knew whose wife it was. He knew her. How do I know that the Bible tells me that? And I'm naive enough to believe what the Bible says, folks. Amen. And then verse 3, and David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, it is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Uriah was one of David's main men in battle as well. He was out fighting for David. But you see, sometimes what we know doesn't go into our process machine. What we know is wrong, but it doesn't go into our process machine. It didn't go into David's process machine just at that time. But it's about to. It's about to just a little further down in the Scripture. And David sent messengers to go get Bathsheba and to bring her to his house. And the Bible says he lay with her. Whenever you read that in the Scripture, 
It means what it says. It means that he had an affair with her. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and says, I am with child. Now the scene is not so beautiful, is it? It's not so peaceful. Now other people is going to find out about what David did. But let me tell you something. Adultery was punishable by death in the Old Testament. Now, this doesn't mean it's all right. You know that. But in the New Testament, we are living under the grace dispensation period. Jesus Christ took the blame for our ungodliness. Folks, that should make us love each other a little more. That should make us love ourselves a little more. That should make us want to learn more about God and His ways through the Bible, through Bible study, through, through preaching, uh, through Awana, whatever. That should make us want to search the Bible more. But you know what I believe? I believe the Bible is the one book in our house that has more dust on it. Shame on us. Shame on us. When the Bible is paid less attention to in our homes, in our lives, than any other book out there. David knew the Word of God. Now, the woman that he slept with is now pregnant. So what do I do with the child? Well, you can read the rest of the Scripture. I'm just going to paraphrase it a little bit for lack of time, give you a Reader's Digest version of it. So now David has got to cover up. He's still not processing correctly. So, Uriah is out in the field now. David sends for him to come. Word gets to him. They didn't have the cell phone that we have. He didn't text him. He sent someone to pick him up and brought him home and wanted him to go to his house and sleep with his wife, which was 100% legal. And Uriah wouldn't go. Folks, we're seeing here in Uriah some of the dedication that men had in World War II. That quit whatever they were doing and join the uh, armed forces in order to fight against the enemy. Uriah wasn't about to have fun back home when his men was out fighting and dying. He wasn't about to do that. And then we find David still is not processing what is going on. So now he's got to send Uriah back. And he calls Joab, his, I guess his general or whatever, and he says, put him on the front line of the worst battle. In other words, David now was growing his sin. He was growing his sin of adultery, and now it's getting to be and going to be and did be murder. Murder. I think what I'm saying is that we need to pay more attention to our little sins. Now, don't get me wrong, sin is sin. But I want to help you and me process things. You see, the look. The look wasn't any more sinful than the going up on the roof of his house. But it's how he processed that look 
that led him further into this destructive mode that he was in. My challenge to your pastor, your pastors, and to you today is that we look at sin as God looked at it. Sin is dishonoring God, and there's not a one of us in the house. If I would ask you to raise your hand, if you was okay with honoring God, it's not a one of you in the house that would raise your hand. Why? Because we love God. God is holy, holy, holy. The Lord God. Almighty. And we believe that. We believe that. We don't have problems processing that. So what I'm saying is that first look or that first thought, stop it before it gets you in more trouble. And my friends, it will. It will. If we keep following it. That's why Jesus came. That's why he came down to take care, using a phrase from a message last year, he came down to take care of our mess, to clean up our mess. So, okay, you say, now, Pastor, I am a bit messy. And we have to realize that before, before we go any further. We have to realize that we are messy and our showers won't clean it up. That won't do it. The only thing that will clean it up is Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross of us confessing. David certainly lived a number of years, and we aren't sure how many, before his sin got to him. Oh yeah, he's had sleepless nights. We have those, I have those, you have those. But it was several years later that his sin got his attention. We go all the way over to the last point of the scripture and we're going back to that Another week, don't, don't think we're through with that. Psalms 51. You know, David wrote a lot of the Psalms, not all of them. But you can kind of tell where David is in his life as you read the Psalm. And this Psalm 51, David is realizing what he has done. He's realizing that it is robbing him of who he was created to be. Sin will rob you and I. It won't change the fact that we were created in God's image, but it will rob us from believing that. From believing that. So here in Psalms 51, and you read the whole thing. I'm not going to go through the whole thing now. You read the whole thing tonight before you go to bed. Uh, Psalms 51, David's writing, and he begins that very first verse with, God, have mercy on me, O God, according to your Loving kindness. Yeah, God is love. We sang about that earlier. God is love. Oh, what love? Why would God love us when we have dishonored him? Because he loves us. That's why, folks. That's why David was receiving in the Old Testament, folks, David was receiving God's grace. Just like you and I receive it in the New Testament. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to your multitudes of mercies, blot out my transgressions. The only thing that will blot out our sins is for us to come to that point in our processing system that we realize that something is holding us back. Something has, has tarnished our lives. And the only thing that can cleanse that is the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we accept the fact of who we are, where we are, and still accept the fact 
that God loves us just like we are, but too much to let us stay that way, then we are ready to be cleansed by His blood. Amen, Amen is right. Then we are ready to let it go and move forward. So I think without a script, my question would be, as we get ready to do the invitation hymn, my question would be, are you satisfied where you are in your life? Now, when you accepted Christ, you became a child of God. I, I, I'm not going against that at all. But are you satisfied with where you are? Are you portraying a good image of God or a bad image of God? You know, the only sin in that is not recognizing it. Sin always takes us further than we intended to go, keeps us longer than we intended to stay, and costs us more than we ever intended to pay. But you know what? Jesus paid that price for us when he went to the cross. Never forget our nature to sin. Never forget God's love to forgive. That's what I'll leave you with today. Father, thank you. Thank you for showing us the life of an individual just like we are and how much that can cost us our joy, and even our image, even if that image is tarnished just from us. But thank you for the fact that Jesus Christ came down to clean us up. But he won't turn the shower of his blood on until we come to the right point in processing what we have done and getting ready to move forward for what you want us to do. Your will be done in this invitation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.